Hello. On behalf of All One Body and the Hesed Project CRC, welcome to this conversation with Clay Leibold. This past June, Senate 2022, made some decisions concerning human sexuality that has raised questions for many of us. One such question is, how should we approach the Bible in matters of sexuality? So we have invited Reverend Leibolt, a respected pastor and biblical scholar and creator of the blog, The Peripatetic Pastor, to help us work our way through this question. And he will do this in conversation with Reverend Thea Link and myself, Don Heisinga. Let's begin with prayer, please. Lord Jesus, thank you for loving us, especially for adopting us as your children. As you know, we in the CRC family are experiencing deep conflict with one another concerning matters of sexuality. But there is no conflict about this. We desire to love our neighbor as you have loved us, those inside our church family and those outside, no matter their sexual identity. So we ask you to bend this conversation toward that end. For the sake of Jesus, amen. Amen. All right, we're going to begin by allowing Clay Leibold to introduce himself and Thea Link to introduce herself. And then I will introduce myself very briefly. And then we will begin asking Clay some questions and Thea will ask the first question. So Clay, will you introduce yourself, please? Yeah, thanks, Don. Um, I'm Clay Leibold. I um, have, was a longtime pastor of a church in East Lansing, Michigan. Uh, I was there for 31 years, retired in 2011, and since that time have been um, interim pastor in a number of places, including where I'm at right now, which is Beaverton, Oregon. I am uh, a writer for the banner, especially I cover synods, and I um, do a blog. Um, and if you've been on my website, which uh, Don already named, peripateticpastor.com, you'll see that my blogs are long and arcane. <laughs> that's, that's probably what you need to know about me. Hi, I'm Thea Link. Uh, I am a retired minister in the Christian Reformed Church. Most recently spent 15 years at Eastern Avenue Christian Reformed Church in Grand Rapids. And I had the honor of uh, calling Clay my pastor for several years when my husband and I lived in East Lansing. So it's good to be on in a video with you again, or I guess never again, but in a video with you, Clay. (laughs) (laughs) Hi, I'm Don Heisinga, and I've professed Jesus in high school, and I've been a disciple of his ever since. I'm a board member of All One Body. And for 39 years, I taught the Old Testament and Reformed doctrine in local Christian schools. I'm glad to be here. All right, I'm gonna get us started then with our conversation, Clay. And as Don mentioned in the introduction to this video, um, our major question is, is the one I'm gonna ask to start us off. How do we approach the Bible in matters of sexuality? Um, And are there some approaches that we shouldn't be taking in reading scripture and understanding it around this issue? Yeah, so this is a specific question about biblical interpretation, which um, is, as a matter of fact, uh, part of of biblical interpretation in general. I mean, how do you do biblical interpretation? And um, let me just start with a little story. So um, a, a number of years ago, several decades ago now, Um, I was heavily engaged in the denomination, in the Christian Reformed Church, in the whole issue of whether women can serve um, in church office or not. And I am so grateful for people like Thea um, now serving in in church office. And um, in the middle of that argument, um, which uh, went from synod to synod to synod to synod, uh, we talked a lot about texts. We, there, were, there were three specific texts in the New Testament that we argued about uh, endlessly. 
And it occurred to me finally, um, when, I, when we stepped away from it a little bit, that we were trying to do theology by grammar, um, it, which just doesn't work. Um, so uh, one grammarian would say, this text means this, and another grammarian would say, this text means this, and, um, and that would be the basis of the argument. The problem with that is that that's not really the way the Bible works. So when you approach the questions that we're approaching now, the questions of uh, human sexuality and especially uh, homosexuality, uh, what people do is they turn to the seven texts that are found in the New Test in the in the Bible, and of those seven texts, um, you know you can go through and you can do an analysis of each of the texts, which I've done. Um, I did a blog post in which I went through all seven of them. And, and in the end, when you go through all seven of those, you'll find that um, they are uh, very difficult to apply to the contemporary situation. Because the, the world, the ancient world, just didn't know anything about consensual homosexuality. They didn't. Um, for them, it was often a matter of, of, of rape, forced um, sex, that sort of thing. So um, you, you, you try to take the text, for example, from Leviticus or these uh, two stories from Genesis and Judges and make any kind of application to modern society, and they just don't work. What we're trying to do in that is to take the Bible as if it were a kind of law book. And then as a law book, um, parsing the grammar of it and then parsing the grammar of it, trying to figure out how that applies to a person. But that's not how the Bible works. The Bible is, as a matter of fact, a conversation. It's an, it's an ancient conversation. And that conversation continues into the present. A person who really coalesced that idea for me um, is Benjamin Sommer. He's a Jewish scholar, teaches at uh, a Jewish theological seminary in New York City. Uh, he wrote a book called Revelation and Authority um, in which he, he, he worked on those texts which are found in oh, Exodus about 19 through Exodus 24, where Moses is going up and down the mountain and, um, and there's this whole question of what God is saying from the mountain. And, and Summer approaches this from a very Jewish point of view. And he says that in Judaism, what you study is what the rabbi said about it. You, you, you rarely study the text itself. You study what the rabbi said about the text and, um, and you go back and forth on that. And then he says, um, the, this is, so this is a continuous conversation which has been going on in Jewish circles um, now for 2,000 and more years, 3,000 years, I suppose. And, but he says that, that conversation didn't start when the Bible was finished. It's already present in the Bible. There are in those texts, uh, points of view being expressed, conversation being had. And, and that's true of the Bible generally. There's a, there's a broad conversation between the New Testament and the Old Testament. Um, there's a conversation within the Old Testament surrounding the whole idea of why did uh, Jerusalem fall? There, there are conversation after conversation. And what we do have to do is to approach it conversationally. Uh, one of the ways that I've um, talked about that is in terms of a kind of um, uh, informed imagination. So this is what I think the church does, has always done, um, starting with the earliest church and up to today, although the Reformation kind of tried to peel off in a certain direction. It, it takes a concept, let's say the Trinity, and it, it, uh, it tries to formulate it. That's the imaginative part. Now, how, how do we understand God if God is both one and three? And, and they try to formulate that, and then they walk that formulation back into the scriptures and say, now, what does the scriptures say about that? What, how do the scriptures um, respond to that kind of imaginative interpretation? And, um, and then um, they modify, as a result of that biblical study, modify what they are looking at, and they begin to produce um, an even better idea of what it means for God to be one and three. So human sexuality, let's talk about human sexuality. How, how, would, I, how would I approach it? How, would, how should someone approach it? How should someone who is deeply 
uh, insinuated into biblical thought um, approach it? And, and the answer is that you, you have to look at what does the Bible say about who human beings are? We are embodied. Uh, uh, that's, that's crucial. Um, and then what are, what are the values that the Bible brings to relationships? And so now suddenly you have a, a new thing, same-sex marriage. Um, as far as I know, there's never been same-sex marriage in history before about um, 15 years ago or so. Um, and so, so now you take that concept and you say, what biblical values here are um, maybe uh, credited and what biblical values might be violated? And, and you walk it back into the Bible. And, and one of the things that occurs to me in the Bible is, is that in, in terms of relationships, um, the, the, the greatest values have to do with constancy, faithfulness. Um, there, there's a word in the Old Testament, hesed, uh, hesed project. Um, hesed is um, this idea of loyalty and uh, that God is, God is a God of hesed. God is God, a loyal God. God is a God who sticks with the people. Um, that, that's a very important relational rubric. And then you, you go into the New Testament and agape is basically a kind of New Testament uh, it's not a translation, but a New Testament um, reflection of Hesed in the Old Testament. And, and so those are the values, constancy, faithfulness, um, that if you're going to be intimate with someone, you need to be in the context of that kind of both safety and commitment. And so maybe same-sex marriage is a good thing. You know, that's what I think... Um, you, you come to. The way the, the HSR report uh, approached it was they tried to make a, um, an argument based on um, a lot of grammar and um, based on a kind of reading of Matthew 19 um, and then Matthew 19, which references Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 um, and trying to construct a creation order argument that way. It doesn't work. It just doesn't work. It's not really biblical. I'm going to stop there. All right. I got, I got, I started preaching. Um, yeah, that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody asked me the other day. Uh, so Clay, what makes you preach? Well, you, you just found out. So, uh, <laughs> so you're talking about a, a, uh, the Bible as a conversational, as a conversation and that we should take right. a conversational approach to scripture. So can you give us an example of that with like, say the Leviticus pa passages, the, the uh, holiness code in Leviticus? Yeah. Okay. So uh, uh, two of the passages are from Leviticus 18 and 20. Um, and they're, uh, they're repetition. I mean, they're, they're mostly they are the same, except that 20 has a penalty and 18 and uh, Leviticus 18 doesn't. Um, and uh, the penalty is the blood shall be upon their heads. Yeah, so it's, it's a pretty violent kind of thing. If the scholars are really, um, of they're not certain what the holiness code is really all about. Um, it appears that it's late, uh, maybe even um, something that was done during the exilic period. Uh, and, and the question there is, um, what does it mean to be holy, right? And so it, it, the holiness code specifies a whole bunch of, of ways of um, being holy and it, it doesn't like anything being mixed. For, so for example, uh, this thing that I'm wearing, which I'm sure is mixed of several different threads, according to the holiness code, uh, uh, that's, not, that's not legitimate. You shouldn't be wearing this because it's mixed up two different threads. You shouldn't plant two different seeds in, the, in a field, um, it, on and on it goes. So what's that about? You have to ask. It's about, I think, um, th that, uh, that question of what holiness is. And, and so you have to ask that question again of what holiness is. And, and there, there's a very sophisticated argument about this. I, I don't want to get into it uh, really now, but uh, Jonathan Haidt, um, uh, a contemporary author, uh, writes about uh, the fact that there is um, in many, many different uh, mor moral codes, 
Um, this idea of kind of the ick factor, you know, and, and that maybe that protected us as human beings at one time, because if you um, if you looked at a piece of food and um, it was uh, icky, um, you shouldn't eat it uh, because if you do, you're likely to die. Um, is there something to that? Is there something in that that we need to think about in, in contemporary ways? And I don't know that. I haven't actually done this work. Um, but I would love to take the holiness code and, and say, now, how can we have a conversation with this text? We, we, we reject most of it, actually. Um, uh, there's all kinds of things in there that we don't do. Um, and, uh, and so what people, when people pick those two texts out of the holiness code, they say, these two texts are still valid, but... Most of the rest of them aren't. Um, they pick and choose. You know, that's not very good biblical studies. But what is it about holiness that's being conveyed about uh, in, this pass in these passages in Leviticus? And what can that tell us in contemporary life about what, what it means to, to stand aside, to be holy, to be um, that kind of person? Uh, I think that would be a really interesting conversation. So if I hear you correctly, uh, we ought not be starting with grammar. We ought not be starting, starting is the key word there, with uh, the Bible as a rule book. But we need to start with how our contemporary culture understands sexuality and then look at biblical themes, is that right? And uh, things like covenant and commitment, and then uh, ask questions of the Bible through those themes, sort of. Um, yeah, that, that's kind of partly right, I think, Don. Um, okay. The mistake that people make about what I'm saying is that they think I'm saying, oh, just leave it a little fuzzy, you know? Um, or that the grammar doesn't matter. Uh, I, I, I think that actually um, you have to read every word and have to read it really carefully. This is really um, very carefully written literature. Uh, if, if you take, especially back in the, uh, some of those early passages of Genesis and so forth, every word it must have been uh, slaved over, pondered over. It is, um, it's very carefully written. So don't neglect any word, but if in fact, you're interpreting it and you find that you have to fudge the words, you know, you, you, that um, you look at this and you say, well, that can't quite be right. Then that's a clue to you that you're misreading it, that you're not reading it correctly. And so, so for example, the, the, um, the holiness code, let's go back there. If you read through that and you say, well, you know, maybe we got to push this stuff away, then that what means is you're not really getting what this code is about. Um, because the writers who wrote this are um, fully aware of what they are putting down here. And I think they're fully aware it's kind of radical. And they are pushing us in a, in a direction. And now, uh, we might, if we're, if we're following the kind of biblical studies that has been done for uh, thousands of years, we would say, oh, now we're going to push back on this a little bit. But when we push back, then the text pushes back on us again. And in that dialogue, we begin to see what it is that the writers are actually doing here. Um, so every word is important. I, I, uh, I don't want to fudge anything in the text. Um, you know, that's the, one of the problems with reading the early chapters of Genesis is that um, people say, well, you know, let's just kind of um, take a, 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 there's some general truths here and, and then we'll kind of get rid of all the, all, all the, other. that's, that's not right. This, this is, this is literary. It's very, it's done very well. Or what the HSR does actually, what the HSR does is to say, we're going to reduce this down to a few set of principles, and then we can apply those principles everywhere. Um, and that's really efficient because then all of a sudden you got these principles and you can apply them. But you lose the beauty and the literature. You lose the text. You, you lose what the Bible is, is really doing. 
Um, and, and I know Thea understands this. Thea's a writer, you know, she's, uh, um, and uh, uh, she, she knows that, you know, every word has to be, if you become a writer when you write a sentence and then you tear it up and write another one because that first one wasn't good enough. Um, these are sentences that have been written over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that clarification. And that actually clicks well with uh, some Jewish, few Jewish scholars that I have written, who have said, uh, read, not written, read, who have said something like, precisely because every word counts is why we need to have conversation, because that's the only way we're likely to get this right, to have a conversation about what that word can possibly mean. Yeah. Right, right. So, so uh, what is the writer doing in this passage? And, um, and, how, and how, do you, uh, how do you get at not just the, 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 um, the kind of explicit um, sentence, but all the illusions? Uh, Paul um, is a Bible scholar, right? So when he writes, He's always alluding to this story and that story. And when you go back to that story or that, or that one, suddenly you get a fuller context for what Paul's thinking about in, in those places. Yes. So uh, how far should we go with this conversation in terms of whom we converse with? Should we be listening to other denominations and how they address this issue? Yeah, I, I, we, we should be, we're part of a big conversation. Um, and that conversation includes not just other denominations, but includes um, the whole world of Jewish scholarship um, and, and so forth. There, there's a tradition, you know, going, there's, a, I, uh, I have a metaphor of, of the cathedral and um, uh, there's a great tradition going back um, all the way to the beginning of the scriptures. And that tradition, um, is kind of like um, a, a, a big cathedral and, and we're all part of it. We're in it. We don't have to like everything in it. Um, we, we, we can look up and say, uh, you know, I don't like that or I don't like that, but we don't create it. It's this long, beautiful tradition of which we're a part. Uh, th there's a tendency in Protestantism and maybe a tendency, especially in a, in a certain kind of reform Protestantism to um, pull away from other people and say, no, they're wrong, we're right. No, no that's, not, that's not correct. We, we, we have our insights. We wanna preserve those insights. They're great insights. Um, but there are other insights which we can learn from other people. And um, I, I think that one of the things that's actually happened, it's a kind of um, interesting phenomenon in our time, is that people are less and less, uh, quote, denominational, and they are more and more um, in conversation with a whole set of uh, Christian traditions. So, yes, uh, we have to be in conversation with, with everybody. Okay. Uh, um, I've also uh, read something that you wrote that we need to think as human beings about what, it what as a human being, does it mean to be a human sexual being, and that we should reflect on that and then ask ourselves, uh, what is of God as we think about this? And what isn't of God as we think about this as best we can? Uh, could you comment on that, please? Yeah, I'd go back to where I was uh, just a bit ago, which is um, that, yeah, God, you know, the, 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 that beautiful story in Genesis 2, of God creating um, sexuality in a way. Um, and, and then, um, and so when God creates sexuality, um, suddenly you realize that, that we, we exist in at least pairs and probably more than pairs, right? We, we exist in, uh, in a wonderful way um, in relationship to each other, and that that relationship to each other is not only um, spiritual or intellectual or whatever, it is physical. It is, um, we are bodies, and um, we, we share bodies together. Um, 
uh, and, and so that's where I would start. And then, and then what are the values that have to um, support that and, and reinforce that? And, and it, it, I think it's universally held that by people that read the Bible that uh, one of the principal values is a kind of constancy. Um, and that constancy is um, easily violated. You know, you, you got to, wandering eye for somebody else. And uh, in that you lose something which is precious. Uh, that's where I'd start. I'd, I'd start with something like that. Um, Clay, in one of your blogs, you talked about a, a dynamic called informed imagination as a dynamic we should apply to how we uh, read and understand the Bible. Um, could you talk a little bit further more about that? Yeah. So uh, what I what I think you ought to do, uh, uh, both of those words are important. The first one, informed, means you need to read the Bible with um, all the information you can get about the text. Um, there are people who say, well, you can just read it any way you want. No, no. You, 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 need, to, uh, you need to pay attention to the grammar in that sense. You need to pay attention to the words. You need to pay attention to the, the whatever we know of the history. Um, all of those things, you know, that's what I've trained in, and uh, that's that's good stuff. In fact, I've got uh, I'm got stacked up on my desk here um, a Hebrew Bible and a Greek lexicon, and you know, all of those things. That's that's informed. Be informed, however you can be. Um, there are good commentaries, you know. Be informed, but then take that and walk it into the scriptures, and as you read read imaginatively because this is imaginative literature. And uh, it, it's, it's like one of the problems, so let, let me back up here. One of the problems that we have in today's world is that people don't read very much or they don't read very well. They read off the small screen, right? Or they, um, uh, they don't read literature. They don't read um, the, the, the great works of literature. But if you read a great work of literature, you know that every page you have to ponder and you have to come back to and you have to uh, try to imagine yourself into it. And, and um, so you need both those things. So, so bring your imaginative um, theological construction, um, but then walk it back into what you know of that text. And when I'm preaching, I, I suspect this is true for you too, when I'm preaching, I, I'm, I'm always a, kind of on a knife edge between those things. Um, you know, I don't want to violate the text. I want to make sure that I do the text well, uh, that I, that I uh, pay attention to what the text actually says. But at the same time, how does that imaginatively work in our world today? Um, and so you, you need to be both of those things. And, and if you do that, the Bible comes alive. Um, I, I've had a, a saying for a long time, just sort of to myself, which is, you know, you're on the right track when you're reading a text and that text leads you to another text and leads you to another text and leads you to another text. And suddenly you, you realize you're on the end of a string here that goes all the way through the whole scriptures. And you say, oh, I think I saw something here, which is deeply, deeply biblical. Clay, um... You know, the Bible talks about the Holy Spirit leading us into all truth. And uh, you also said things like sometimes the Holy Spirit goes ahead of the church. And we need to ask ourselves what new thing might the Holy Spirit be doing in our church? Uh, I think we all struggle with how do we know when it's the leading of the Holy Spirit and not simply an extension of our you know, biases and prejudices. So could you comment on that, please? Yeah, let me make two comments and I'll try to be brief about them. But the first one is that um, our prejudices and, uh, and so forth are, are, the fact that we are insinuated into a culture um, is true, whether you're reading it traditionally or reading it not traditionally. I mean, um, there is, we are, as a matter of fact, um, seeing things through the eyes of our culture, regardless um, of whether we read it the way it's always been read or as we think it's always been read or whatever. So um, there's, no way, there's no getting away from that, except for the fact 
that as you read and as the culture discovers new things, parts of the Bible come alive which haven't been uh, seem to be so alive before. Um, and the spirit seems to be out in front of the church, leading us on. You know, Jesus said, um, the spirit will lead you into all truth, right? Um, the, the spirit um, is, as, is, as I said, often uh, out in front of the church. Um, it, it, I mean, perhaps the greatest example of that is the Galatians 3 passage, um, uh, which uh, in, in that passage, uh, Paul says, in Christ, there is no Jew or Greek, slave or free, male or female. Um, and it's as if the church has kind of been working on this project for now some 2000 years. And at first, you know, the whole thing was, how, how do you understand? And as a matter of fact, we haven't got that figured out yet. But how do, how do you understand the relationship between uh, being Jewish and being Gentile in, in, in Christ? How, how does that work? And, uh, and then uh, slave or free, right? Um, and a, a lot of stuff a couple of centuries ago, and in fact, a century and a half ago. And, and then lately in the church, we've been discussing about gender and um, male or female. You know, what does that mean really? And how, what does that mean in Christ? And, and so here it is in the text, but we've been slowly spooling it out over a long period of time. And what Paul, I mean, I don't know what Paul meant by it, but, but what, what, does, what did the spirit mean by it? Um, I think the spirit was leading us on. I, I mean, the greatest example of this, the, the, the absolutely stunning example of this is Isaiah 53. Um, so Isaiah 53 was probably written in the context of the fall of Jerusalem. And the question there was, uh, what is, what is the meaning of suffering? What is the meaning when a, when a people suffers? And it writes this, this, uh, beautiful narrative, uh, poetry about, uh, the suffering servant. And then you get Christ, um, who just fills up that passage in, in so many stunning ways, the spirit way out ahead of mm. and, and, and I have a, um, a, a little strange thing called uh, which I a little strange theology which I, I call the God who pushes and the God who pulls and and, and you need both um, uh, you need to understand God sometimes as pushing things into existence uh, but fundamentally the Bible is about the God who who summons us. So think of God, not so much, I mean, you can think of God at the beginning of history, but, but think of God, not just at the beginning of history, but at the end of history, at the end of all things, pulling us in, into newness. Creation isn't finished yet, you know, and God is summoning us. And, and maybe part of that summons is to say, that sexuality doesn't just mean sex between a man and a woman. It can mean sex between two men or sex between two women. And, and there's a whole variety. We are, we are sexual in a variety of ways. And God is summoning us into this insight, um, standing at the end of, of history. And, and the Bible, the spirit book, gives us some clues about what that might look like. But you got to hear the call. So that's my way of thinking about that. All right. Thank you, Clay. Now, we asked you a question that we could spend weeks on, right? And you could teach an entire class on. Uh, but we don't have the time for that. So I want to give you a chance to make any last comment. And Thea, you too. I, I, I just want to speak to the... Uh, for a moment to anybody that has tuned this in and um, who has been told that the Bible condemns you because you are um, uh, gay or uh, lesbian or trans or whatever. And um, you grew up in the church and, and you want to take the Bible seriously. 
Um, so um, now you feel uh, crushed by that. I wanna say to you that that's not true. Um, I wanna say to whoever it is um, that's tuning this in, who's looking into the Bible and searching those texts to say that those texts need to be set into the context of the entire scripture and the conversation of the scripture. And then in doing so, what you'll discover is that the Bible is a rich source of spirituality. I, I watched a, uh, one of the earlier videos and Jim Lucas said something about the, uh, that his spirituality, since he's come out as gay, his spirituality has deepened and uh, he's become closer to God. Uh, your closeness to God does not depend on the kind of biblical interpretation which people in the church have too often tried to lay, lay on you. And so um, please feel free uh, to understand that God loves you. Stop there. And I'll just say amen <laughs> to that. Thank you, Clay, and thank you, Thea. Uh, and if you want to investigate uh, Clay's wisdom anymore, make sure you do check out the Perry Patetic Pastor. And also, please check out All One Body's website. We will attempt to continue to offer uh, wisdom, helpful videos such as this. Thank you for joining us.